Brad. Thank you very much, Brad. I appreciate it. And thank you, Kurt V. Brands, for getting me uh, in here today. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be talking to ad tech because the whole point of ad tech is connecting emotion to technology. And that was the whole point of Steve Jobs' life and career. There were people in this world who were probably better technologists. I think even Steve would admit, at least uh, every now and then, that Bill Gates was a better technologist. And certainly there were people who were more emotional as artists. Steve would say Bob Dylan fits into that category. But nobody of our day and generation was able to connect emotion to technology, to co connect art to engineering the way Steve Jobs did. I think that was the secret to his success, and that's what he created at Apple Computer. He called me up in 2004 and asked me uh, if I would consider writing a biography of him. I had just finished, as Brad said, doing Ben Franklin and was working on Albert Einstein. And I must admit, I thought, wow, that's a bit arrogant. You know, Franklin, Einstein, he thinks he's next in the sequence. So I said, hey, you know, you're young. Uh, maybe in 20 or 30 years, when you retire, I'll think about it. Because he was in an up and down career. He hadn't yet done the iPhone or the iPad. <clears throat> but uh, we'd stay in touch every now and then. I had met him back in 1984 when he brought the Macintosh to Time Magazine to show us what a perfect, insanely great product it was. And even then, I had been impressed both by his passion and his petulance. But I saw that the passion and the petulance were connected. He was petulant because he was mad about some story that somebody had done in Time Magazine and the fact that he had not been selected Man of the Year as he thought he should be. Uh, and, you know, at first you roll your eyes a bit, but then you realize, as I hope I try to show in this book, that the behavior, that little bit of brattiness or petulance or that way he could be rough on people, was actually part and parcel of his genius. It was part of his passion, and it was part of his perfectionism. So this notion of connecting emotion to technology is something I had seen in Jobs for many, many years. By 2009, his wife mentions to me, if you're going to ever do a book on Steve, you better do it now. And I realized that he had just gone on medical leave again, was having his liver transplant. And I said to his wife, Oh, you know, he didn't tell me when he first called me that he had cancer. And she said, no, he didn't tell anybody. He called you right before he was being operated on and he was keeping it secret. So then I realized that I had an opportunity to really do somebody who was the Benjamin Franklin and Albert Einstein of our time. Somebody who thought differently, had a great deal of romance and poetry in his soul but could also connect it to practical engineering. As many of you know, he grew up in California, the adopted child of an auto mechanic, actually a repo man. He used to repossess cars for the finance company when people didn't pay it, and then he would fix up the cars and sell them. Paul Jobs was a perfect salt-of-the-earth father for Steve. Uh, Paul Jobs had never gone to college. In fact, he dropped out of high school to join the Coast Guard during World War II. But he had a real appreciation of craftsmanship. And as uh, Steve was a young kid, he would sit in the garage with his father and look at the end-to-end -end craftsmanship that went into a car. How the car manufacturer had integrated everything. The engine, the drivetrain, the chassis, but also the design. And Steve always felt that all products should have that end-to-end -end integration that he loved watching his father do when he uh, helped uh, fix up cars. One day they were building a fence. I remember Steve walked me around the old neighborhood near Cupertino where he grew up. And his dad was building a fence around the backyard of their house. And his dad told him, you have to make the back of the fence just as beautiful as the front of the fence. And Steve said, why? Nobody will ever know. And his father said, you'll know. And that's a mark of a good craftsman, to make the parts unseen just as beautiful 
as the parts you can see. So that, too, becomes part of what Steve Jobs does, whether it's the first circuit boards of the Macintosh, all the way to the end, the parts unseen have to be beautiful. Uh, at one point, um, he went across the street and told the girl, Lisa, who lived across the street from him, that he had been adopted. And the girl said, oh, did that mean your real parents didn't want you and abandon you? And Steve said, I ran across the street to talk to my parents, Paul and Clara Jobs, and I was crying. And they said, no, no, Steve, listen to me, listen to us. You're special. You were picked out. It wasn't people didn't want you. We specifically chose you. So I asked Steve, growing up, knowing he'd been adopted in a different environment than where he was born, what effect that had. Did it make him feel abandoned? He said, no, it made me feel chosen and special. But it also made me feel that I was not a part of the environment around me, which made me feel a bit of a misfit and a rebel. And that, too, is part of what Steve did growing up. That notion of what was happening in the late 1960s, especially in California, which was two great cultural currents. One was the counterculture. Uh, with the music and the acid and the uh, hippie culture that was growing up of rebels, uh, people, uh, the free speech movement at Berkeley. There was also, though, the uh, Silicon Valley was beginning to grow up from the defense industry, the microchip makers. Everybody on the block seemed to be an engineer at Hewlett Packard or Northrop Grumman or one of the defense or electronic firms. And Steve said that growing up, he always wanted to connect the culture of the counterculture, the, the notion of the poetry that came from uh, the hippie movements and the counterculture where he grew up. He wanted to connect that to the electronics culture. And you found a group of people doing that back in the early 1970s in Silicon Valley. The Homebrew Computer Club, the Whole Earth Catalog, this whole atmosphere that computers should no longer be the province of the power structure or the Pentagon or the great corporations, but computers could be empowering and they could enable you to fulfill your potential, be artistic. And that is what this movement helped produce with Steve Jobs as its epitome. He also grew up in an interesting house. They were called Joseph Eichler Homes. And they were incredibly inexpensive. His parents were very poor, but they grew up in this Eichler house, which were these mass marketed cookie cutter suburban tract homes. But they were based on Frank Lloyd Wright, very simple designs with lots of glass, exposed beams, very open patterns. And Steve said, I learned from that the importance of being able to mass market good design and make it affordable for everybody. Uh, he ends up uh, meeting at Homestead High School a guy who had recently graduated from the school, Steve Wozniak. And they start pulling a lot of pranks, pranks that involve uh, searching out Bob Dylan albums, but also uh, the bootleg tapes and figuring out how to replicate them but also doing things like ripping off the phone company with the blue box that uh, Wozniak was able to design that could replicate the tones of the uh, bell system so you could make long distance phone calls. They even called the Vatican at one point using one of these and uh, Woz pretended to be Henry Kissinger and says, I want to speak to the Pope. I am at the summit meeting. And uh, after a few hours of back and forth, they were about to get the Pope, and I think they figured it out over at the Vatican that it wasn't really Henry Kissinger. But it was that notion of prankishness, that notion of geeky electronics, that, uh, that notion of being a misfit and a rebel with it, that really appealed to Steve. And what Steve figured out, starting with the blue box, was that he could take Waz's designs and actually package them. So it wouldn't be some little circuit board and in which you could make a phone call, but it'd be carefully put into a case, and they'd market it uh, to all of their friends. They sold a couple of hundred of them, and that's how Apple Computer was born. Because eventually Steve also figures out, 
how to make a great circuit board, the circuit board that becomes the Apple One. And he and uh, uh, Waz and Jobs bring it to um, the Homebrew Computer Club every week, meeting in Palo Alto, and they show it off, and they show off the design for it, and Waz wants to give it away for free. But what Steve Jobs does is says, no, no, we can make a case, we can put it together, we can make it a, a product that's not just for hobbyists and hackers, but is a product for the rest of us. And from that, of course, comes the Apple II, where Steve's love of beautiful design makes it into a molded uh, plastic case. Absolutely beautiful. He wants to connect the art to the technology. And even though Waz deserves and gets credit for the creation of the Apple II circuit board, it's really the beautiful power supply, the wonderful case, the integrated product end-to-end, -end, tightly integrated, uh, that helped spark the home computer revolution. I'm not sure there are many people here old enough to remember the Altair and the Apple II and others, but it was the Apple II that finally allows you to bring a computer home, take it out of a box, and actually use it. There was one argument that Waz and Jobs had about the Apple II. Waz wanted to have a lot of slots. He wanted it to be able to be opened up. He wanted people to be able to jack in and put their own circuits in, their own peripherals, to put in their own software if they wanted to. Jobs said, no, we don't want that. No slots, no way to open it. They have an argument, and Waz actually thinks of quitting. And Waz wins the argument. The Apple II had about eight slots in it, in addition to the ones that were necessary to be used. So people could hack into it, people could do whatever they wanted with it. This causes a split between Waz and Steve Jobs, because when Steve starts working on the, Apple, uh, on the Macintosh, he wants it to be an end-to-end -end controlled appliance. That, to me, is the essence of what Steve Jobs' greatness and also, to some extent, his weakness was. He was totally controlling, and it came from his childhood. And he believed that if you had a passion for perfection, if you wanted to make a product insanely great, you had to control the hardware, the software, you couldn't let people jack in, you couldn't open it up, you couldn't put your own operating system on a Macintosh hardware, or use a Macintosh hardware, I uh, mean, use the Macintosh operating system to be licensed out to, uh, on another piece of hardware. And that end-to-end -end integrated control becomes a signature of really the artist that Steve Jobs felt he was. Not only that, when they did the Macintosh, they had screws on it, and Steve was upset. He said, well, people can open it up and get to the circuit boards and whatever. And they, he ended up insisting that he use a type of screw and a type of fastener, so you couldn't even open up the Macintosh. Nevertheless, as it got nearing completion, he looked at, he kept changing the beauty of the friendliness of the face, cutting that plastic strip down from the front of the Macintosh so it looked like a human face with a smile and everything else. But he looked at the circuit board they were doing, and he said, this sucks. You can't do it. He said, why? He said, the chips aren't perfectly spaced. They're not lined up. They said, well, that's not the way it will work best. And they said, besides, nobody will see it. It's inside. You've made it so you can't open the Mac. Nobody will know. And Steve said to them, the first original Mac team, what his dad had said to him about the fence, which is, you will know. And he made them hold up doing it until they redid the circuit board that nobody would see so that it was absolutely beautiful. He had what they called a reality distortion field. It meant he could make you believe things that were impossible. The odd thing about that is once you believed something that was impossible, you sometimes made it possible. For example, Bill Atkinson was doing the boot up uh, of the uh, original Macintosh, and Steve said, you got to shave 10 seconds off the time. Those of you who remember booting up Windows machines versus booting up Apples, how fast the Apple is. And Atkins says, I can't. I can't shave 10 seconds off. And Steve said, if it would save a human life, would you be able to save 10 seconds off? Atkinson says, yeah, probably. So Steve goes to a little board and he says, look, 
If a million people have this machine, and every time they boot up, it takes 10 seconds, and you multiply it times 365 days a year, this is how many man years you're going to save if you save 10 seconds. Atkinson went back, and two weeks later, he had shaved off 28 seconds of the boot up time. Same with the software and everything else, that reality distortion field, that desire to make something beautiful kept driving that Macintosh team. And indeed, it is, again, the real start of the personal computer. Because the Macintosh, you just pull it out of the box, it smiles at you, it says hello on the screen, and it's a computer everybody can use like an appliance. Steve went to Macy's to look at the Cuisine Art machines so that he could have the beautiful appliance-like feel to it. And it was that end-to-end -end integration that uh, uh, caused it to be such a revolutionary machine. The other thing that caused it to be revolutionary, of course, was the graphical user interface, which Steve and his team had been able to see at Xerox Park as part of a financial deal. Uh, people sometimes say, well, you know, he just took the graphical user interface from Xerox Park. But once he saw it, he realized that between the conception and the execution falls the shadow, as T.S. Eliot said. Xerox didn't know how to execute on something like this. So Jobs and his team take the graphical interface and make it so that you can move the folders and the icons and the documents on the screen, move them around with the mouse, which was not something that Xerox did. They created the pull-down menus. They created the notion of double-click and other things. Uh, when people say it was Xerox who did that work of art, I say, yeah, but Xerox actually came out with the Xerox Star and the Xerox Alto. They sold about 300 machines, i.e., it totally flopped. When the Macintosh comes out, it sets the world on fire. Uh, but what happens is Steve has a, what we used to call in the, when we were doing physics and astronomy, a twin in the binary star system of the digital revolution. A binary star system is when two stars, they have their orbits linked a little bit because they each have a gravitational pull on the other. So you have two guys born in 1955 who dropped out of college, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. They start circling each other. Bill Gates, one of the first things he and Microsoft did was create the spreadsheet program and the word processing program for the original Apple II and then for the Macintosh. But Steve is always afraid that Bill Gates is going to steal the graphical user interface that they're working on for the Macintosh. And indeed, it happens. Uh, uh, Steve gets furious when he realizes that Bill Gates is creating windows and using the same you know, point and click icon system. A very famous exchange between them when uh, Steve drags Bill down from Seattle and says, how can you do this? You're ripping us off. Uh, uses a lot more colorful language than that. And uh, Bill Gates says, no, I don't think I'm ripping you off. It's like both of us broke it. It's like we both brought, had an uncle and broke into his home, and his uncle was called Xerox, and we both stole the same thing from Xerox. Well, this got Steve furious, but what really made him mad was that Bill Gates had an opposite approach to the digital age, the great digital divide. Instead of end-to-end -end control of hardware and software and devices, Bill Gates was quite happy to license Microsoft's operating system to any hardware maker, Hewlett Packard, Dell, Lenovo, IBM. Uh, Windows gets licensed around promiscuously, which means he doesn't have the end-to-end -end control that an artist would want, but it does mean he ends up with market domination. So this becomes sort of the great feud of the digital age. Do you take end-to-end -end integration and try to make a perfect product, or do you let a lot of choice happen, a lot of experimentation, license out your software to work on various devices? Uh, the fact that the Microsoft approach worked better in the mid-1980s is one of the many factors leading to Steve being ousted from Apple. Of course, he was also ousted from Apple because of his strange and brutal and tough and rough and tumble temperament. But I think if uh, the Macintosh had beat out uh, 
uh, Windows machines for the dominant operating system, he would have still been there. But the good thing is, being ousted from Apple really helped Steve perfect how he wants to connect art to technology, be the person who, with his deep emotional sense, connects emotion to engineering. And when I say deep emotional sense, people sometimes ask me, what surprised you the most about Steve Jobs? And I always say how emotional he was. In the middle of our talks, our walks, sitting around the garden of his house in Palo Alto, all of a sudden I'd look up and he'd be crying. And he'd be crying about, you know, how beautiful his wife is or how wonderful the ad copy was for the Think Different campaign or how Lee Clow had really done a beautiful poster or Bob Dylan's song or anything. He got, and it was that ability. I mean, sometimes in the tech world, we say people who don't interact well with others, you know, they have problems emotionally relating to people. Steve's was at the other extreme. He had a deep ability to emotionally relate. And that's why he's able to make products, I think, that emotionally relate it. So eventually he gets brought back to Apple when Apple can't even make its own operating system and, have to buy, and they have to buy the next computer company, which is the company that Steve founded when he was ousted, in order to get the Unix kernel of its operating system to be part of what becomes uh, the Mac OS. Uh, and when he comes back, his first phone call is to Bill Gates. Uh, and he says, look, we've been rivals, we've been friends. I need you to come back and start making so great software again for the Macintosh. And Bill Gates does. He even invests in Apple. They have this wonderful reconciliation where Gates and Microsoft agree that they're going to be the major software vendor for uh, the Mac. Actually, a small footnote here for those of you who are interested in the current disputes of Apple. The other call he makes was to John Warnock and others at Adobe and says, you have to start making Premiere and all the Adobe uh, software for the new Mac. And they say, no, they're not going to do it. And Steve never forgave Adobe. If you're wondering why Flash is not working on your iPad, <laughs> it's not just because it's a spaghetti ball piece of technology that uh, is a battery hog is because Steve told me, I will never forgive Adobe for abandoning us that way. But what Steve does again when he does the iMac is do both those things I mentioned, care passionately about design. He finds at Apple, when he returns, the world's greatest industrial designer languishing almost unnoticed in the design studio, Johnny Ive. And Johnny Ive and Steve Jobs become the team, the design team that's probably the most influential design team in, this century, in the past century, which is creating these wonderful new products for Apple. And wh what is it that they did? Well, you know, with the iMac, they made it look friendly like a bunny. It had that translucent, beyondy blue shell. It looked like it just hopped onto your desk. And by being translucent, you could actually see, finally, that circuit board that Steve insisted be absolutely beautiful. But as they were just about to come out with it, Johnny Ive said, I want to tuck a little handle into the top of the iMac. And the engineers and the people in charge of manufacturing said, well, that's going to cost a whole lot, and that's totally ridiculous, because this is a desktop computer. People aren't supposed to carry it around. But he shows it to Steve, and Steve says, yeah, I get it. People are afraid of computers still. Johnny Ive said, my mom is afraid of a computer. If I put a handle on it, she knows she can touch it. Even if she's never going to carry it around, it gives you a sense it's at your command, at your disposal. That little recessed handle that nobody ever really uses is just a design signifier saying, I'm at your service, I'm friendly, you can touch me. These are the type of things they do throughout as they create the new set of computers at Apple. But something else happens that's particularly important. The end-to-end -end integration of hardware and software, which comes from Steve's passion for perfection, has been a bad business model in general. But he realizes that it will help him go to the next phase of the computer revolution, where the desktop computer is not just a standalone device, 
but it's a digital hub, as he says, that connects all of your digital content and all of your digital devices. And so he creates a digital hub strategy with the iPod, the iPhone, and other things, where your music and your pictures and your video and your content and things you're reading can all be synced with various devices. And no other company can do it as well as Apple, because Apple is the only company that's making hardware, software, devices, and content management systems. The iTunes, the iTunes Store, the, iPad, the iPod, and the Macintosh. And so you have Microsoft trying to replicate it, Bill Gates trying to replicate it. But Bill Gates can't do it for two reasons. One is he doesn't really have the artistic and aesthetic passion that Steve has. And secondly, he doesn't have an end-to-end -end integrated product where he can make things simple by deciding where to move the complexity. In other words, keep it complex on the computer, but make the iPod simple, make the music player simple. So Steve ends up inventing the iPod, and Bill Gates creates the Zune. Steve is able to usher in a whole new digital revolution that's not just about the personal computer now, but it's about your digital lifestyle and connecting it together. And that's what he's able to do for the past decade, because when he came back to Apple, Apple was worth one-fiftieth of what Microsoft was worth in 2000. By 2010, Apple is worth more than Microsoft. By now, it's worth twice as much as Microsoft. And Apple is, on and off in the past month, the most valuable company on Earth. As Steve was very ill, a lot of people came to visit him. But one of the, uh, I was there in Palo Alto when Bill Gates decided he wanted to come visit, about two months ago. Steve is not the most gracious human being. Um, I try, you know, there's a lot of anecdotes in the book about how nasty he can be, but I try to weave it into how it's part and parcel of his passion. But uh, when he first heard that Bill wanted to come visit, he muttered a few things, and the meeting never happened. But eventually Bill Gates was down in Palo Alto and just comes to the back door of Steve's house, knocks on the door, comes into the kitchen, finds Eve, the youngest daughter there, doing her homework. It says, Bill says, is your dad here? And she points to the downstairs room, because Steve was very sick and couldn't go upstairs very easily, where Steve is resting. And they speak for three and a half hours about being the different approaches they took in the digital age. They talk about a whole lot of things, including the fact that uh, computers and technology has transformed almost every industry in this country, from journalism to medicine to law, but hadn't yet transformed education, that the schools have not fully figured out how to be different than they were 400 years ago when somebody invented the notion of putting a teacher in front of a classroom. And they talk about all the future things that could happen with the technology. And finally, Bill Gates, who's a very gracious gentleman, says to Steve, you know, I never thought that the end-to-end -end integrated model could work. But you proved it could work. You proved that integrating hardware, software, content into one appliance-like system could actually work. I thought that was very gracious. And Steve, who definitely is not always that gracious, said, well, you know, Bill, you proved your model could work as well. There's room for both models. This is as Steve is furious at Android for sort of replicating uh, what uh, happened you know, with Microsoft in the 1980s i.e. taking the look and feel of an Apple product and licensing it around promiscuously. But uh, Steve says, you know, you prove that that open model of open licensing and different competing hardware manufacturers uh, using the software, you prove that could also work. And I thought this is a beautiful ending to my book when I heard it from both sides. But the good thing about the digital age is everybody in it's a bit quirky. So when I talked to Bill Gates about that scene. He said, well, there was one thing I didn't tell Steve. I said that the end-to-end -end integrated model worked, but I think it only works if you have a Steve Jobs there, somebody with a total passion for absolute control, wants end-to-end -end control, and is going to micromanage every bit of it till he gets it. I thought, um, 
Well, that's sort of a backhanded compliment. So when I saw Steve later, uh, the next day, I said, here's what Bill said. It could only work if you were in charge. And Steve looks at me and says, what an asshole. <laughs> Anybody could have made it work as long as they had a little bit of taste. And I said, but Steve, you told him that his model also worked. And he looked at me and said, yeah, it also works. But it only works if you don't care about making crappy products. <laughs> so anyway, the book ends the way it should, with not everything tidily wrapped up, with Android still competing with Apple operating systems, with these two different types of approaches out there, which I think does allow the passion and perfection of a Steve Jobs to do what he does best, but also a thousand inventors to find a thousand ways to use open systems and do what they do best. And so for me, that connection of creativity to technology can happen in many different ways. My book is a pay on to Steve Jobs' genius, but I also know he has flaws. And I say, this isn't a how-to book for how the digital age should run. This is just a biography of one guy, and you can learn a lot of lessons from it, good and bad. Thank you all very much, and I'd love to answer. <laughs> there are microphones right there, and I tried to rush through this so we could have some questions and dialogue. We have about 10, 15 minutes, so stand up at a mic if you would, or wave your hand frantically. Ah, yes, there's lights, cameras, action. Hi, my name is Arjun. I actually go to the New York Institute of Technology. Um, and as a young entrepreneur, I would like to know um, what are some of the challenges or some of the obstacles that Steve Jobs was able to overcome um, as a young entrepreneur himself back in the old days and something I could take away as an advice. Yeah. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, who is actually a young entrepreneur like yourself, um, <laughs> asked him that question a couple of months ago. And he said, you know, what am I supposed to do? And one of the things Steve Jobs said was, the most important thing you'll create is not your first, second product or whatever. It's not your ability to create a product that then allows you to go public. If you're serious about this, you're going to create a company. You're going to do the hard work of actually creating a company where you can adopt, where the creativity connects to the technology, and you can create new products as the old ones don't work. He said most people consider themselves, on, he said, I hate the word entrepreneur, because most people call themselves entrepreneurs, they just want to do a startup and get out of it. They don't want to do the hard work, which is actually to get a team of A players, make sure that they can work together, and to create the environment where creativity will flourish. And he said, people said I was pretty nasty to people when I worked with them. But that's because I was trying to create a team of A players and prevent the bozo explosion that happens when you allow mediocre people there and all you're caring about is making a profit. You should not care about profits. Profits come third. What comes before profits is good products. And what comes first is a good company that will always make good products. And so I think the advice is not to maximize profit or even to see if you can have a hit product, but see if you can have a truly good team and you're willing to make the hard commitment that I want to build a great company. And if you ask Steve, as I did, what's the greatest thing you ever created? He'll say in an instant, not the iPad or the iPod or the iPhone or the iMac. He'll say Apple. He'll say it's a place where a generation from now, I hope, we'll still have that intersection of emotion and creativity on the one hand and technology and engineering on the other. Thank you. Hi, I had heard an early uh, working title of the book, uh, I, Steve, the Book yeah. of Jobs, and I thought that can't be right. They're not going to name it that. Yeah. Can you comment on that? I can comment on it and be very honest about it, which was, yes, they, uh, Simon & Schuster had a cover with him and a little Apple logo and it said, I, Steve, and I signed off on it. I mean, this was a year and a half ago, uh, or a year ago, I don't know when. Uh, and, you know, I figured we'd figure this out, but it, it seemed cute or whatever. 
So my daughter, who's a computer science student in college, told me it sucked. She said it was the worst idea she'd ever heard. She said, for God's sake, get rid of it. My wife said the same thing. Even my father, who's an engineer down in New Orleans in his 80s, he said, surely you can't be doing something that gimmicky. Plus, the cover looks bad. I'm flying to California. I said, okay, fine, fine, my wife. I'm flying to California to meet with Steve on one of my 40, 50 interviews. And when I get off the plane in San Francisco, there's like, I actually have my iPhone set so that if he calls or sends a message, it has a particular, you know, signal. It's like the phone is going nuts. He's called about five times. So I call him from, you know, the concourse of San Francisco Airport. And he says, this is, I just saw this thing online. It's a stupid, it totally sucks. I'm not going to cooperate anymore. You know, this, you have no taste. This is... <laughs> I had never really seen the brunt of his anger before. I had been told about it, but he's nice to me because, you know, I'm writing the book. He was not nice. So I got the phone out here, and I'm listening for a while. And he's yelling, and he says, I don't want even, I think I was going to, like, the iPad launch or something. I don't even want you to be in the audience. <laughs> and so I don't say much because there's actually not much point in trying to get a word in in these situations. And um, he said, in fact, I'm not going to do any more with you unless you promise to let me have input into what the cover design will be. I'm not an idiot. It only <laughs> took me about a second or a second and a half to say, wow, yes, that's a great, I mean, the guy with the best design eye in the world. He had said he didn't want to read the book beforehand. He was going to exercise no control. But the notion of letting him help design the cover, I thought, wow, yeah, I'll take that deal any day. And he became obsessive about designing the cover. I don't know if anybody has the book, if you want to hold it up or something. Yeah, just hold it up. I mean, it is about as Apple of a product as you can get. Helvetica type, the Albert Watson photo that was done in, 19, in 2009. And, it, and he obsessed with Terry Oyama and others of his staff on just the simplicity of that design. So I will someday be asked in my dotage, what is the best mistake you ever made? And I will say, having a design of the cover that said, I, Steve, with him in a stupid logo that got him so mad because it ends up with him helping create that cover. Thank you. Hi, my name's Curtis. In the first chapter, you paint a beautiful picture of how Steve Jobs was a product of his environment with the Silicon Valley at the yeah. time. Stanford University giving land so they could yeah. commercialize the technology. I almost wanted to write a history of Silicon Valley. I had to keep scaling it back. It's it was so interesting. It was totally interesting. I'd, I'd been there in the, in the 70s with the surplus stores, the manufacturing, yeah. the production. Yeah, he worked at Haltech, that surplus electronics store. Right. Uh, so my question is, now that we have moved all the manufacturing to offshore, to East Asia, we don't see the engineers working hand in hand in the same place with this, this hothouse incubator. Can we produce another Steve Jobs? No, I mean, yes, we can, but it is going to be a real problem. And this is, you put your finger exactly on the problem. And he felt it was a problem. And he and Obama had some exchanges on this issue in the past year or so, which is... <coughs> If you're going to offshore manufacturing, after a while you offshore the engineering that goes with the manufacturing. Then you offshore the design that goes with it and the quality control. And Steve said, I have 700,000 workers in China. He says this to Obama, he says it to me, you know, meaning Foxconn and so And he said, you know, I said, you've got to bring them back to America. How would you bring He said, you can only bring them back to America if you had 30,000 engineers. Because to support 700,000 people in a factory, you need 30,000 engineers. This is the exact converse, is it, of what you're saying, which is you don't create those engineers if you don't have the manufacturing. Well, the converse is if you don't have those engineers, you can't have the manufacturing. So he says we need the 30,000 engineers. He's not talking about Caltech, MIT, Harvard, PhD engineers. He's talking about the people like my dad who came back from the Navy, you know, became an engineer, hired people in New Orleans from Delgado Trade School who knew how to do mechanical and electrical engineering, and they could run the shipbuilding and other factories in New Orleans. Well, 
Uh, we lack that right now. We don't have the education system putting out just pure industrial engineers. We have brilliant scientist engineers who are PhDs, but we don't have the 30,000 a year coming out of our community colleges and LSUs and Tulane. And secondly, uh, when we do train engineers from overseas, as soon as we get totally trained, we kick them out. This makes no sense. So he had a big argument with Obama on that. But I think we will never be a great creative nation unless we remain a great manufacturing nation. Let me... One more. One more? Yeah. I'm Andrew Marie Thassen. I had a quick question on, you talked about uh, Steve and Bill talking about the education sector not seeing the benefits of uh, mm -hmm. the computing. I'm wondering how that conversation went. Did anything ever come up with it? Did they agree on what can be done? Steve Jobs, next, he would have transformed three industries, having transformed eight others, had he lived. One, as you probably read, because I mentioned in my book, would be television. There's no reason your television should be as brain dead as televisions are these days, where you have two remote controls and 16, you know, you can't figure out how to tape, you know, the uh, LSU Alabama game if you're not going to be there. Um, he would have transformed digital photography, because that's really just a question of writing the right algorithms to take the photons, you know, in a low light thing and, you know, make that work. But the third industry I think he would have transformed would have been the textbook industry. There's, I mean, there is truly no reason to have teachers standing in front of a classroom of 20 kids lecturing and then using a textbook that they have to carry around. Most kids don't even have lockers in school because of security reasons. And these knapsacks, so they get spavined kids, you know, with their bent backs, using old textbooks that have to appeal to the least common denominator in states I won't mention because I'll get in trouble for textbook rules, when everything could be done as it's done in New Orleans now and some of the schools after the hurricane, where all the curriculum is interactive and digital and you learn at your own pace, just like you and I, if we needed to learn something, we'd go to Khan Academy or something to learn it. We wouldn't go to a local college to sit in a lecture hall. You know, kids can do their, hear their lectures, do their lessons, do the interactive testing of it at home, work collaboratively when they get to school. You reinvent the whole model of the school if you reinvent the textbook and lecture model. That's what Steve would have done, I think, and I hope someday somebody in this room will be the Steve Jobs that will do it. Thank you all. I'm, I'm going to sign books out there if you want. Walter, thank you very much. That okay. was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Great. Great. So, Great. so, ladies and gentlemen, Walter is going to sign books at the top of the stairs. You go right through those doors and up there. We're going to have a break from the conference so that you can go to the expo and you can also get your book signed. And thank you all for coming.